So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm James Kidd from Mills and Reeve, and this is... Uh, I'm Becky Wilson from Pure Resourcing. I know we didn't rehearse that bit, but I always do I that. Never you well. you. <laughs> <laughs> On my screen, you're there. Oh, the wonders, <laughs> the wonders of Zoom. Uh, so together, uh, Mills and Reeve and Pure, Becky and I put together something called HR Energy. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. It's just our collaboration to provide events and networking opportunities networking, remember that, um, <laughs> to local HR professionals. So today we are really, really pleased to be joined by Michelle Gant. I'm going to ask Michelle to uh, introduce herself in a second, but today is all about engagement. So uh, just a bit of housekeeping and then we'll hand over and then Becky's going to do the uh, exit stuff when we um, finish. So we'll be done by three o'clock. Uh, we are very happy for you to be an engaged audience. Do you see what I did there? It's just like a rehearsal. Seamless, seamless. Uh, brilliant, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, which, so by all means use the chat function to talk to us. Your uh, comments will be visible to everybody and we'll interrupt uh, Michelle as we go through with brilliant questions or not so brilliant questions, depending on how good you are in the chat. Um, and then if there's anything we need to wash up at the end, we'll deal with that. Uh, there will be a feedback form, which will pop up at the end. Uh, please uh, do complete that and that will also ask you some questions about how you think about coming to events in a physical world as opposed to a virtual world uh, and Becky will remind you about that at the end. This is being recorded, uh, the announcement has already gone up to this is being recorded but you might get another announcement later because our uh, IT is glitching at the moment uh, and actually it might not be recorded because uh, it really is glitching but at the moment we hope that it is. Becky, have I covered everything? I think you have, as always. You're too kind. Right. Uh, enjoy, everybody. I'll hand over to Michelle. Thanks, James. And, and thanks, Becky, as well, for asking me to come and talk to you this afternoon about employee engagement. Um, it's really good to, to be here virtually with you. And we know employee engagement is so important, and particularly now when we are physically disconnected. So just to let you know a bit about me, um, I run a company called the Engaging People Company, which does exactly what it says on the tin. We engage people. Um, I'm also a coach um, and a trainer and facilitator. But prior to setting up the company, I was a director of engagement for housing association. So I looked after the communications and HR functions, which allowed me to bring the whole engagement process together. Um, and I led their entry on the Time Stop 100 uh, three years in a row. So I'm really, really passionate about uh, employee engagement and the benefits that it can bring. So I'm just going to share my slides with you now. And I'm going to talk to you um, this afternoon about some general principles, about some of the key things that we need for effective um, employee engagement. But I'm also going to talk to you about what's happening now and where do we go from here. So I'm sure that lots of you are already engaging people, engaging your staff, and you'll have some knowledge about why we even bother talking about this. Um, so I'm just going to touch on this uh, really, really quickly. But why, why engage people? And, and a few years ago, um, I had somebody ask me that. Why should I engage my staff? I pay them. And, I, you know, I guess it was a fair question. But really, the days of the transactional relationship between an employer and employee are over because what we see is we see the benefits of when we engage people, when we make them part of what we're doing, when we create that sense of belonging, when we make them um, satisfied, we empower that satisfaction at work. What we actually see is we see better results. That's how we achieve our vision, our goals, our ambitions. That's how we get the most out of people. So whilst the transactional relationship will get you so far, um, it's not going to get the very best and, and achieve all the amazing things that your organisations want to achieve. So, again, here's just some of the cost benefit analysis. What happens when we don't engage people? Well, it impacts on the quality of work. People are less likely to kind of want to learn and attain skills and knowledge. We're less creative. We're less willing to kind of um, innovate. Impacts on retention um, morale um, because one disengaged employee um, can impact, have a ripple effect across an organisation. Um, it impacts on reputation. I was reading just earlier that um, the Ellen Show, the Ellen Show in America has lost a million viewers as a result of the toxic workplace claims. So it can have a really big impact on, on how you're perceived. 
It will also impact on how organisations recruit. And in the long run, it costs more money because you're having to invest more into the HR policies, into the kind of um, the conversations that you might need to have about managing staff. Obviously, there's a counter to that. What happens then when we engage people? Well, we find that people are more productive, the quality of the work, because there's a real care about what people are doing. They want to learn. They want to gain skills and knowledge. We're more creative when we're engaged, when we're feeling motivated and satisfied. It's easier to keep people because people have a sense of belonging. If it's just a transactional relationship, you don't have that kind of sense of being part of something. It's good for morale, good for the team. It helps you in your reputation. Um, it's easier to recruit. And in the long run, it's, it's neutral uh, in terms of cost. So it, it makes sense to engage people. And we talk about employee engagement, engaging people. What does that actually mean? Well, when we talk about engaging people, what we are essentially saying is we're taking people with us. It's about doing things together, collaboratively, joining up, um, rather than doing things to people. So for some of you that might know a little bit about transactional analysis, what that means in our relationships when we engage people is it's adult to adult. We are doing things equally, wherever, as opposed to kind of the parent child. We're not telling people what to do. We're giving them choices. We're bringing them on board. And we, we know ourselves, perhaps, you know, we talk about um, experiences of micromanagement. We know ourselves how it feels when we're kind of told to do. We're not given the space to, to grow and develop. So engaging people is about how we take people with us to do things collaboratively in an adult adult relationship. So no matter what we're going through, whether it's a pandemic or not, there are some key principles that underpin employee engagement. And I know that some of you will have experience of some of the engage for success um, principles. So these are just some of the kind of themes um, that can underpin your approach. And I think a really, really, hi James. Michelle, can we just yeah. go back a slide? This is yeah. going to be one of my really valuable contributions, okay? <laughs> Uh, no, the previous slide, well, the one with all the people, the top-down view. Hold on a minute. Uh, let's get this one. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So the lady top left, has she been dipping her hand in the <laughs> glass of silver, which appears to be pure silver, molten silver, to do her nails? <laughs> it looks like it, doesn't it? This is, this was, I'm quite impressed with this when I was doing the slides. This popped up and I thought, oh, that's, um, that's a good image to go with it. But yeah, I'm quite impressed by her nails. Um, I wonder if she's uh, obviously not in lockdown nails. She's obviously going to see someone to have them done. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sorry, I am listening, but I was also in trouble. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pipe down again. No, not at all. No, that's a good, uh, a good spot. <laughs> um, yeah, so coming back to what underpins engagement, and I think what really underpins how we engage people is a sense of equality. So it comes back to the point that I made about it being adult to adults. And when we're engaging people, we are equal. It doesn't matter what status we have in an organisation. It doesn't matter what role it, we have. It's a sense that all of us are equal. All of us have something to contribute. All of us have some ideas to contribute. And if we kind of take that approach to engagement, that we are equal, that it is about that adult to adult relationship. It means we're asking really meaningful questions. We really are giving people an opportunity to influence, to empower, to, to have their say. So as a very basis for any engagement, it is that level of equality. We are doing this together. We are collaborating. It's not about doing to people. And then it's about understanding. Now, I always think that when you're kind of planning anything that you're doing in an organisation, when you're planning your policies, your approach, when you're finding out even how people want to be engaged, it's easy when you find out from people. It's about asking questions, finding out what matters to people, finding out what they need. And, and you can do this in lots of different ways. So it could be a temperature ga uh, gauge survey. I used to do one of these um, once a month and just very simple questions. How are you feeling right now? What are you satisfied about? What's the biggest issue for you right now? What's the biggest thing that you might need right now? So kind of really getting down to understanding what people need. And then it's the informal conversations, finding out as managers, what is it that people need? Because when you have that level of understanding, when you know your people, when you know what they need, a far better place to be able to respond, to develop policies and procedures, to do all the things that they need. 
And, and you keep asking these questions, you keep kind of driving those questions and finding out what is it that the people in this organization need. So making that a fundamental part of how you engage people. And the other thing is looking for any opportunities that you might have to ask questions. So it's not just about that kind of temperature gauge, it's, it's not the one-offs, it's, it's, you know, where can you find out? So what did you think of this? What, what might have made it better for you? At the end of a meeting, how was that? You know, was there anything else that we didn't cover? Because that's how we learn, and that's how we grow, and that's how we can respond to the staff and, and what they actually need. But then coming on from that, it's about feedback. Um, one of the things that I often see as a bit of a pitfall is we ask people what they want, um, and then we either don't do anything with it, or we do something too late. So when we're asking people, we've got to kind of close that circle. So if we've asked people, what do you need? We've got to go back to them and say, um, this is what you told us. And the more transparent you can be, the more open you can be. So if people are kind of not happy about things, saying actually people aren't happy about this at the moment, that's going to build up trust. That's going to be a really kind of authentic approach. And the more trust you can build in an organisation, the closer your connections are going to be. So it doesn't mean that you have to kind of do everything that people want, but it does mean you have to be open and honest and say when you can't do the things that people want. Making that transparent, making that really kind of that, that free back cycle um, ongoing, it, it really helps to build that connection, build that trust. Um, one of the things I used to do as at the end of every temperature gauge survey, we'd sit down at management team and we'd say, OK, so what are the biggest issues? what are we going to do about it and what can't we do at the moment and then we're going to go out and we're going to put those out and in our communications we wouldn't just pull out the negative the positive quotes and we pull out the negative ones and we'd be really transparent about that and I think it's so important if we're asking people and we really mean it and we really want to find out how people feel and we really place value on it then feeding back what people are telling us is vital as well. So is there a, a real value as well to quick win? So if someone is suggested X, Y, Z, and you think, yeah. oh, I can do that. I, may, I need to think about the bigger wins, but actually feedback with, yeah, we can do that. Let's do it. And it's done. Yeah. That helps the trust, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I think that's what people need to see. They need to see that you've heard them and you're not just kind of communicating the good stuff and, you know, what, what great organisation. But if there's any quick wins, just go and do them um, and, and get them done and, and not be afraid of saying if you can't do something straight away, because also that what I see happens is we've got uh, some feedback and say something needs to change over time. Nothing gets said about it. Well, we can't do anything with that right now, but um, we'll park it. But actually, if you're going to park it and you need to come back to it, just say, just be honest about it. So the more quick wins you can you can get, the better. But then that also brings me on to this slide, because actually it's not just about you fixing things for um, for people. It's about empowering people to kind of come up with the solutions as well. We know that for, your well, for our well-being, we need to feel that we have control and we have influence. And when we feel that we don't have any control or influence, we feel disempowered and it impacts on our well-being. So wherever possible as well, looking for opportunities to empower people to come up with solutions. So if you're getting feedback and people are asking for um, a certain thing that might take place over a period of time, then empower staff and say, do you know what? You said this is a real issue. We know it's an issue. We'd like to bring together a group of you to look at it. There you are, that's your remit, off you go and, and come up with solutions. So it's it's really kind of, it, it's coming back to this whole, all the time coming back to this adult, adult, you know, it's not just about us the leaders, the managers, HR fixing things. It's about empowering people and saying, this is what you told us. Would anybody like to help us come up with a solution? Would you like to lead on this? This is something that you've said, uh, um, come up with a solution. The more opportunities we can look for giving people power, giving them um, delegated responsibility to do things, the more we'll see them increase satisfaction, the more we'll see them become more effective, We'll see them become more innovative. So I've, I've got a couple of examples. Um, I had a staff newsletter and I thought the easiest thing in the world would have been for um, my team to write it because it was comms, um, comms team can write it. But actually that's, you know, that's an opportunity where I thought this is an opportunity to really empower staff. So we trained up a group of staff from all across the organisation and they were responsible for the staff newsletter. And I had very, very little input bar kind of setting those parameters 
Um, another thing was about um, a management. So managers need to have that clarity about what's expected of them, but they also need to have a bit of leeway about what they can do. So a toolkit for them to give them an idea of what was their responsibility, but then giving them some freedom within that. It's, it's being clear about, you know, what the bound boundaries are, because we do need clarity, but then giving people power to take the lead on things and find their own solutions to take a lead on projects, because they're much more likely to succeed when you're kind of empowering staff to do projects, to take the lead on things. Um, and you'll see far better engagement and satisfaction in that. So communication is absolutely key to engagement. Um, it's absolutely key. It's got to be uh, continuous. It's got to be accessible. Um, it's got to be authentic. It's got to be transparent. It's got to be across different channels. What's really important, and I think this is a, a really good quote because I think this happens so much that often in organisations, there's a sense that um, communications happens by osmosis. You know, I, I presume they know. Actually, I think that's they're aware of that. We've got to be really clear about that. We've got to tell people what's happening and, and communicate in an accessible way, in a meaningful way that's going to have the impact it's going to reach people. I'm a real advocate of plain English. We used to use plain English all the time. We did lots and lots of plain English workshops right across the organisation, particularly because we were dealing with um, customers. And it's always about communicating for the people who are receiving it. You want your communications to have the impact that people read them, that they understand them, they know what it means to them. So keeping it really, really accessible and then making it regular and being consistent and saying things even when there's nothing new to say, um, because what often happens is we fall into communications voids. So there's nothing new to say, so I'm not going to communicate. But it's so important, particularly at this time when we cannot all be together, to keep communicating, to keep updating people, to keep letting people know what's happening. And when you're thinking about your communications, it's also thinking about your tone of voice and the key messages. And a lot of these can come from your values. So if you've got organizational values, that can kind of underpin your key messages. So you have that consistency. What is really important though, is that communications is absolutely the heart of how you engage people and that you keep doing it and you keep doing it in different ways and you keep communicating, you know, in an accessible, clear, transparent way so people know exactly what's going on. You don't want your staff having to look for information or finding out from other people. So, Michelle, if you yeah. genuinely have nothing to say at that particular yeah. point, what do you say? So I think if you, for example, if you an ongoing, say you've got a weekly newsletter, um, you might just say, how are things? Have you got any questions for us this week? There's nothing new to report. Um, you might be at the minute you might be doing up weekly updates about the COVID, you know what that means for you. But you can actually just kind of check in at the end of a week and just say, how are things for you? Hope you've had a good week. If you've got any questions, come back to us. We haven't got anything new to report about the um, changes for office. As soon as we do, we'll know. We'll let you know, because actually people do still need that. And the more gap you have between communications, the more that happens is misconception thrives. It, it just reassures people, and especially at the moment when there is so much uncertainty, it's so important that we just keep connected, and even if it's just checking in. And if you're thinking, you know, and I think a lot of organisations think, I don't want to over-communicate, I think it's important to communicate, make it regular. And if you're doing it on a Friday afternoon, think, I've got to get it out on a Friday afternoon and make it a priority. Because the other thing I think that often happens is that some of this stuff slips because it doesn't feel like a priority, Whereas it's probably the most important thing you should be doing because you need to keep your staff connected, engaged to keep delivering um, all the things that you need your organisation to be doing. So timetabling it, you know, making sure it's happening. And it doesn't have to be masses of information. It can just be checking in because people need that at the moment. They need to feel reassured that, yes, we know this is probably a concern for you, but we haven't got anything new to report. And that's fine. Sometimes people need, need that. I've seen gaps of months where, you know, somebody said, I've got nothing new to say, so I'm not going to get in, in touch. And by that time, you know, a complaint has grown and an issue, a big, a, an issue has grown out of it. And you then end up dealing with something. So just keep those communications going, keep those channels going. And don't be afraid of just saying nothing new to report, just checking in. It's, it's absolutely fine. 
Another really, really important part of engagement is appreciation and recognition. We need um, three times as much recognition to take notice of it as the, the negative. We, we always notice the criticism. We always notice the bad stuff. So if we've had a really good meeting, the first thing we'll do will come out and say, I could have done that better, rather than recognising all the good stuff. So at the very heart of engaging people is making sure you recognise people, but meaningfully as well. And so it's in your formal and your informal practices. So having formal structures in place to say, to show that recognition, to say thank you, but also informal management behaviours. A, a formal scheme that I had coming back to the whole point of adult adult um, and empowering people was I had a goodie cupboard um, in my company and it was filled with all sorts of goodies like crisps and chocolate and wine and, and basically any member of staff could come to HR and say I want to say thank you to somebody and they could take a card and they could take something out of the goodie cupboard and give it to them because it's about empowering everybody it's not just the management that can say well done what was really nice about that was you'd get reverse um, kind of appreciation so the chief exec would go in and there'd be a bottle of wine on his desk and a card from a member of staff to say thank you for a great job and it creates a really good culture of I'm going to say thank you and there's nobody kind of abused it it was just the scheme everybody could buy into and know the value of saying thank you so however you show appreciation make sure that it's empowering make sure it involves everybody and be careful about some of the things that might be a bit divisive or might um, kind of recognise the wrong behaviours. So, for example, I always think about with schools, the uh, attendance awards, you know, actually, what's that saying about well-being? We, we value well-being, but we're going to we're going to you know reward you for presenteeism. So, again, just be mindful. But it's, it's such an important part of how you you engage your staff. Michelle, I have to say with that, I think absolutely it's so important the thank you, feeling appreciated. But I think also it has to be authentic. Yeah, yeah. Feel that it's coming from a real true place, not that it's, oh, well, we'll just do it just to say thank you. That it's got to really feel that it's a thank you and not just being said. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I think it's got to be meaningful. And I think that's, you know, the way you kind of make sure it's meaningful by thinking about perhaps you could tie a scheme into your values and value behaviours. So actually, if you want to recognise something, it's about recognising people delivering on our values, but making it meaningful, because actually, if it's not meaningful, it impacts on the person receiving it as well, because they think, well, you know, it doesn't feel of value. Um, but I also think it's OK sometimes just to say, well done for the day job. Because so many times you might say, great job, it's, like, it's just my job. And actually, you know, some things that people are doing in their day job are amazing. And it's OK just to say, great job today. When it's least expected, I think it's the most powerful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And Michelle, I hope that somebody uh, made an award from the goodie cupboard to the HR team from time to time. Oh, I know. Well, I, I had a few things out of it, which is always the wine, <laughs> which is nice to be. Was that 4 30 on a Friday afternoon? Yeah. We just thought, I deserve yeah. this. Two bottles. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, it was always very welcome to come to your desk to find a bottle of wine on there. So, uh... <laughs> so I just want to share with you now a, a kind of a structure for engagement. Um, now, when I kind of took over the uh, engagement, it was how can we engage every stage of the employee experience? And then the policies and the procedures would support that. So the question was, how can we engage at every stage? And these are the stages um, that we looked at. So obvious, well, obvious points of contact were like recruitment. That's a really significant uh, milestone. Um, so induction, things like we'd have um, induction buddies. So before you started, I did some research and I found that when people were starting, you know, one of the things that concerned them were things like, where do I have my lunch? What do people wear? You know, what time do we go home? Do people go to the pub after work? That kind of stuff that you don't necessarily get in your letter of um, offer, offer letter. So what we did was we set up induction buddies. So before anybody started, they'd have a buddy and they'd be able to kind of email them and ask those questions. They might not want to ask their manager. We'd also do things like uh, welcome plans because the other thing we found was you know, we like to know what's happening. Uncertainty has a big impact on our, our well-being and our mental health. And obviously, we, we can't be certain of everything, but we like to give a degree of certainty. So we have um, a plan which would show where what people would be doing in the first week. So 
turning up on, you know, sort of nine o'clock on the first day blind, you'd be like, well, you're going to be spending the first hour with IT, you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing all those things. There were other things like, you know, sitting down with the chief exec, having lunch with the chief exec. So making sure every stage there are opportunities to engage people, to bring them in, to, to make them feel that sense of belonging. And, and what really became clear as we worked through it is there's some other elements, other stages that often get overlooked. So the endings is a really significant stage of engagement. And what often happens in organisations is that as you kind of go on, um, as, as people start to leave, you start to disconnect from them and say, well, you know, I won't need to do your, um, uh, in, your appraisal because you're leaving, or you don't need to come to this meeting because you're leaving. But actually, there needs to be some real kind of um, value in that engagement and, and those conversations that you have around saying thank you and wishing people well as they move on. Um, so there's a real opportunity at in, in, in endings because that's the point of time where people then go away and they'll be talking about your organisation, which then brings me on to alumni. You also have an opportunity uh, around alumni. Uh, before we do that, can we just, yeah. sorry, I'm going to interrupt again, sorry. Uh, just go back to recruitment. We've just had a new member of the team uh, join us. And one of the virtues of everyone working from home, and Becky, you might like this, is that we have team socials and uh, our new recruit coming in working their notice period could join our team socials on a Friday afternoon. So we got to know them and they got to know us so much better than we would have ever done if we were working in the office. So it was a brilliant way of getting the culture across and frankly, us getting to know them. And so when they start, there's no strangers. Uh, everybody knows everyone's um, peculiarities, if I put it like that way. Uh, and actually, it was a brilliant way of having an informal induction before they actually start. Uh, so recommend Zoom type inductions where it, in a social gathering for new recruits. Are, are you doing any of that, Becky? Yeah, yeah, we do. I know a lot of um, companies that we're talking to, I think the whole zoom um, teams process now whereby you're interviewing a lot of your recruitment is online generally i think people feel more relaxed you see the real person at home but it opens up more informal conversations and culture and people are made to feel i think we go the extra mile because we're not in there in person so i think people are making more of an effort now for people to feel more part of it before they start so absolutely yeah Great. We're encouraging all our clients when they're recruiting, start talking to that person, get them involved in the team online before they start. And it just feels a very natural first day for them. That's brilliant. I think that's such a good point. I mean, it, it is much easier now to do it by Zoom. I mean, before I started my last job, I actually went in and spent half a day and I found out where my desk was and I found out, you know, I was given my phone. And actually, when you kind of do that, you remove a lot of the kind of uncertainty when you start because you already have a sense of belonging. So those informal points of contact, which is facilitated by Zoom or, you know, one day again in person, allows you to kind of make person feel part of the team right from the beginning. So, again, alumni, I mean, that's a really good opportunity because as much as you're, you do your kind of communications and your PR the people who work for you, and particularly the people who leave, can become your advocates. So perhaps thinking about a friends of scheme. So after your staff leave, um, obviously, if they kind of leave and it's a positive um, departure, often the opportunity to become friends of your organisation. So you could keep them updated with Christmas cards, newsletters. What happens when you do that is they are talking about you within the community and they are telling other people about you and what a great employee you are. But also you keep connected because you don't know one day they may want to come back. So asking this question every stage, every stage of your the employee experience, and thinking, what else can I do? What could I do to engage people, to take people with me um, on these touch points? And I've also included pre-employee because before people even come to you, um, you have an opportunity to let them know what sort of employee you are. And that's often around your communication, how you present yourself, and particularly perhaps about how you engage with schools and apprenticeship schemes and, and let them know that you are the employer of choice. So I know um, from speaking to lots and lots of HR people that, you know, the question of who's responsible for um, engagement and HR often feels it's, it's all their job. But I'm really pleased to tell you it's everybody's job in an organisation to engage staff. It's not just HR. HR has a really important part to play. You are the conduits for making things happen. 
but it's not all your responsibility. Everybody has a role to play in engaging people in an organisation. So we start with the leaders. The leaders are, do two really important things for you. The leaders set the tone. They set the kind of uh, the key messages, the tone of the organisation. They set the parameters for your engagement, um, perhaps through the values and, and the expectations of what kind of organisation that it is, um, the culture of your organisation. So you can use that to kind of guide the engagement activities. But also leaders themselves are really, really powerful at engaging. And I always used to say to my chief exec, there are three flaws in our organization. And I'd say, you know, when you kind of walk, and it's obviously called managing by walking about, when you walk on every floor and you talk to everybody and you come back to your office, that's probably the most important thing you do all day because you're engaging with people, you're connecting with people. And there's a really value for people um, to feel that chief exec, that, you know, the leaders of an organization have stopped to talk to them, to make them feel valued. Then there's your managers, and there is no there is no engagement without your managers, and your managers are really, really important, and we know how difficult a role it is being a manager, and, and managers need two things to engage well. So managers need to be engaged, they need to know, um, be engaged in the organisation, they need to know what's going on, they need to have access to knowledge, so they can be that conduit. But managers also need to have the parameters for engagement. They need to know what's expected of them and they need to have some empowerment within that. So helping your managers to engage and, and giving them that guidance, because we often hear that saying, you know, people don't leave an organisation, they leave, them, leave a manager. So helping your managers, empowering your managers to be powerful engagement, having good conversations, doing some um, development around that, giving them the policies and procedures that, give them the tools to do everything they need to, but also keeping them engaged because often they can be a disconnect between the leaders and the managers. So making sure they know what's going on, they feel a sense of belonging, they feel part of the decision-making is so vital. And then there's the HR people, teams, and all the things that you do to make this stuff happen. So um, you actually make the engagement stuff happen. You make the kind of, the, uh, the recognition schemes happen, you come up with all the development uh, processes, you come up with off with communications around the communications processes, you come up with the events, you make all the stuff happen, you come up with the engagement strategy, but with the support of everybody, and everybody playing their part. So your part is really, really key, because you actually make it happen. And you are the holders of the, the engagement plans and activities. And, and often you will be teamed up with communications as it was in my organization. We had HR and communications working hand in hand to engage people. But you know, right from the start, I said um, at the very key to engaging people is this adult adult relationship. And so there is also a responsibility of the staff to engage. Um, with what you're doing. Uh, I often hear a complaint, you know, that, oh, I've done all this and I'm not getting anything back. Well, actually, you know, it's not just your responsibility to be driving the engagement. There has to be something back. So if you're offering all these opportunities, all these, um, all these tools and techniques and channels, then there is an onus on staff as well. It, it, they are an active participant in this. We're not doing things to people, we're doing things with people and we are engaging them. So bearing that in mind as well, as you kind of move forward, that as an adult to adult relationship, you can present all these opportunities, but there is also responsibility at the end of it for the employee to engage back as well. So those are kind of the key principles. Yep, hi James. Uh, I've got a chat comment and a question going to the chat comment first yeah uh, we have a culture where this tends so we're talking about engagement tends to fall to hr but we've now consciously called the department managers the people team i like that to help them recognize that this sits with them too we meet monthly mm -hmm. and talk about all things people and we'll create task forces for well-being talent management communications etc sounds great doesn't it that really does fantastic it's great that you recognize that and able to kind of engage other people in delivering it uh, and the uh, question is, one engagement slash communication issue I've been thinking about uh, is the circle of contacts employees have seems a lot smaller when working remotely and people tend to favour reaching out to those they've physically worked with and therefore have that, I guess, connection with, uh, and they aren't connecting with as many new people. This seems especially problematic when it comes to new starters. Any ideas, top tips, Michelle, on how to combat that? So... 
I mean, I think that's it's, it's you know probably is what's happening. I think it's much easier to connect remotely with people that you already know. Um, I am actually going to come on and talk specifically about what's happening now. So there might be some tips in there. Um, but if I don't kind of address it, we can come back to it and, and see if there's any ideas that perhaps we can come up with around that. But um, it is a really, really tricky time, um, what's happening now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how, you know, all the principles I've talked about still apply. They still apply um, now, but there's some specific things that are happening and have been happening over the last year. So um, I'll come on to that now. Um, so we are working remotely. It's been a year. Yesterday marked a year um, since this has been the norm. We've... Um, been working remotely and there's been lots of benefits of it and I think you know probably before the pandemic um, I always used to, when I used to work in, in an office uh, in the company I always used to love working from home I'd be I can't wait two days a week I'm working from home it means I don't have to commute I don't I can put the washing on I can do all those things I can you know have a proper lunch go for a walk and it was really really exciting and actually the reality is now that you know working from home is very different because actually the other thing and I hear it said a lot is we're working from home in a crisis this is not a normal situation so it's not perhaps what we've known before um, and it poses real real challenges and I think we can never forget the situation that we're in as we're working we are working from home we're working in a pandemic this has will have impacted on us in so many different ways our mental health our well-being so it's OK to kind of cut ourselves a bit of slack about how we're doing, how we're feeling and, and, and perhaps some of the issues that are occurring. Because if we were working from home or working from home and it was a normal situation, um, it would be very, very different. But I've spoken to a lot of people over the last year about what's what's the impact of so what's happening when we're working from home. Um, and there's lots of different things. So we're seeing a lack of boundaries. So, you know, the kind of work life balance, the flexibility, because we are working from home, a bit of bleeding into perhaps um, working longer hours, um, perhaps working a little bit more than perhaps you would if you're in an office. Those kind of not clear demarcations of this is my end, you know, it's the end of my day. It kind of keeps going. People can feel really isolated without that contact. They can feel very alone um, and that can impact on their sense of um, how they're doing their well-being there is a lack of balance and particularly I think you know when people had homeschooling as well going on people were feeling very overwhelmed and trying to do everything and perhaps feeling that they weren't doing anything particularly well there's a lack of support um, what used to happen when you're in the office if you had a question you just wander over to your manager's desk or your colleague's desk and say I've got this issue and I'm not sure um, if it's right. And, and sometimes you weren't even asking for advice. You were just testing it out, saying it out loud, but you don't have that anymore. And so actually it can really impact on your own confidence and, and how you're doing, because it's not, it's not just the big support. It's not kind of just the one-to-ones. It's not just the meetings. It's that kind of ongoing informal support that, you know, sometimes just being able to say stuff out loud to somebody else and work it out yourself. There's practical difficulties, technology. You know, the biggest thing for me over the last year has been the, the challenge, you know, of, of technology, trying to get used to that. Um, and it can be a real issue, particularly, you know, where we were in, in Norfolk, where sometimes it, it drops in and out. Um, there's a lack of connection. It comes back to the isolation. There's a, a lack of connection uh, practically, um, but there's also a lack of connection in feeling that you're not part of the team. You're not feeling that sense of belonging because you're not seeing people. You're not having that kind of ongoing um, relationship the workload can be overwhelming or the workload cannot be that much it depends on what's happening with your organization and both can have real impact so you know you might have too much work we often know that the stress it causes but it can also be stressful when you don't have enough work because you want to keep busy and you're worried about your job and you're worried that they're not going to employ you so that can have an impact there's a lack of routine um, you know, the routine that you might have got had before. Uh, and routine is really important in helping us to keep our kind of well-being on track. And there's often a sense of guilt. And there can be a sense of guilt, particularly in organisations where people are furloughed and not furloughed. There's often a bit of a kind of um, competitiveness, a bit of comparison, and it can impact on people's guilt. So working from home is not perhaps the, uh, the fantasy we all had pre-pandemic. So what can we do? So the most important thing first, and I, I don't know if you can um, see it at the top. Uh, sorry, I'll go back. People first, um, task second. So the most important thing is we think about people's well-being. 
you know, because we are all struggling in different ways at different times. And then we think about what support we can give. And that's the kind of practical support. But it's also about the checking in and making sure that people are okay. Wherever possible, we want to give choice. Now, the technology, the great thing about the last year is we've all been able to get on Teams, we've all been able to get on Zoom. You know, the technology has allowed us to do this. But I think the technology can also be a hindrance because what often happens is people's calendars are getting full up one by one by one. So you don't have to worry about going to meetings and that's impacting on people. But I think you can also still give staff choice about how you engage them. So you can say, rather than just going to default Teams or default Zoom, could I give you a call? Or, you know, as the restrictions ease, would you like to meet up and we'll go for a walk? Give them choices because this site, this doesn't work for everybody, this online um, catch up. So wherever possible, look for opportunities to give people choice. Keep communicating, keep communicating, keep communicating, you know, keep in touch with people, just keep communicating. That's what people need to hear. Connect with people and particularly prioritise non-work connection. And I've spoken to people and they've said, um, I really wanted to just ring up and have a chat with them, but I feel guilty because I don't want to take their time because we've got to get the task done. Actually, probably the, it's really important you find spots in your calendar to have that non-work connection, to just ring up and say, I want to have a coffee with you. It's not about work. I just want to talk about to you about line of duty. Because although that sounds sim silly, that's what we did in offices, isn't it? That's what we did in workplaces. We'd go to the we'd go to the kitchen and we'd stand there and have a coffee and we'd have 10 minutes and it would be a break. And what that did in that moment when we're standing there talking about line of duty, we're, we're connecting with people, we're building trust with people, we're feeling a sense of belonging. So actually look for those opportunities, put them in your diary, prioritise them. Um, they are as important as the work stuff because when we go back to the offices and we go back, we, we need to have people as one team feeling part of belonging. Yeah, you know Michelle, we, we've literally just done that at Pure. Okay. So um, our L&D team had the idea, we're all saying we're missing each other. It, it's very easy to get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. So we all sent our, if we're interested, we put our names forward and they paired us up and we blocked out an hour in our diary, linked in with that person that we were paired up with on Teams. We sat with a coffee, biscuits, chocolate, and we just chatted about all sorts of things but it was just so cathartic for all of us it really made us think about how we're so absorbed with the task we're forgetting about our people absolutely and, and, and how difference to all those people just having that little hour talking to their to their work colleagues how did you feel at the end of that Beth, becky oh, i loved it i loved yeah. it i think we all just kept saying we can't wait to see each other in person yeah. but i said to anybody you know if your teams have time i'd really encourage them to encourage their teams it's okay to take that time out and have a coffee remotely and think okay. about each other rather than your task absolutely right and i think that's the thing it is okay it's, it's absolutely okay and i think sometimes we think we've got to have meetings about the task we've got to get the task done but you're going to get the task done a lot better a lot easier and you're going to stay connected if you put in this stuff and say monday morning let's just have a coffee let's chat about the weekend and you feel you know you feel good for it you feel part of a team you, you can talk about the things you're all going through we're all going through the same thing in different ways um so actually looking for those opportunities yeah. And just to laugh as well. Just yeah. to laugh. <laughs> I was thinking that, that going back to the question about how do you help the new starter form those relationships, actually organising one to ones or maybe two to ones between the new starter and somebody from accounts and somebody from sales to enable them to generate their peer group within the organisation in a non threatening talk about line of duty you're clearly a fan. Uh, <laughs> those water cooler moments were, which we're missing. I wonder if that would be a, a a solution to help with that. Yeah, I think I think it definitely would. I think kind of putting more of that in, making people you you kind of have to work harder because you don't have those natural um, points of contact anymore, which were which was so easy to do. So you have to work harder and actually pushing those in, you know, one to ones, two to ones, just having and, and being clear that this isn't task because you know how often easy it is just to slip into. Let's start talking about the work. We're not going to talk about the work for half an hour. I just want to talk about. The organization what matters to us or talk about you know how i'm doing and how i've been getting on and it's really really important because that's the bit that keeps us together that's the bit that when we go back to the offices is going to keep us connected and we're not going to have to start again because if we don't prioritize this stuff then we will have to almost start again building those relationships 
the other thing is about the boundaries um, and role modeling those and there's a kind of a, you know a sense of helping people to understand what matters to them so it's helping them to see that you know that it's okay for them to be having a bad day it's okay for them having to help with homeschooling and, and role modeling some of those behaviors and you know, obviously we all work flexibly, but there's definitely been a creep I've seen of um, really late emails, really late kind of activities and, and still helping people to find space to, to be them and to protect their, their selves. Um, show trust. You know, we, we've got to show trust because we're, we're connected, but show it physically and say, you know, here's a task. These are the parameters. Just come back to me when you've done it and show appreciation as well. And I've seen some really nice examples, I'm sure you you have as well, of where people have sent things through the post for staff just to kind of say thank you. So, for example, if you always used to give out birthday cards in the office and send them in the post, you know, if you had a goodie cupboard, then send stuff in the post because, oh my gosh, isn't that nice, you know, particularly at the moment to receive that sense of thanks. But it can just be saying thank you to people and saying thank you for this. I know it's tough at the minute, but you're doing great. We're doing great. I'm really pleased with how it's, you know, it's going. Um, and seek feedback. Keep checking with people. Keep asking how are things for you? What do you need from me? Keep finding out. Keep asking questions. And, and just stay connected. Look for any opportunities you can to connect. Be deliberate about it. Prioritise the non-work stuff. And, and we'll, we'll kind of come out of this still as one team and, and one sense of belonging. Uh, comment in the chat which actually I was going to ask about which is about don't forget the people on furlough because the um, it's, yeah. it's easier for the people who are around working from home they're at least talking to people but those people on furlough it goes back to I suspect the answer is communication 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 funnily enough and uh, this person says they have an online portal share business information updates but also invite everyone to send pics and they enjoyed everyone's snow day pics That's uh, I think I heard today that so, was it Gavin Williamson said that there won't be any more snow days because of course the schools will just be able to switch to online learning oh. <laughs> not, sure, not entirely sure that's right and didn't we all love snow days didn't we <gasps> the school's closed <laughs> <laughs> that is so true and I, and I think that's a really important point about people who are on furlough it's a bit like when people on maternity in your organization you, you have to kind of keep, keep them connected you have to keep them engaged just because people on furlough they're still part of that organization they still need to feel part of that belonging so it's a really lovely idea and that kind of personal touch as well sharing the, the pictures from the snow um and I think your point as well I was gutted when the, the online learning came on the snowiest day of the year I was like really we have to do some school work today it's meant to be a snow day <laughs> I also like comment uh was in a welcome pack in readiness for day one backpack notepad pen chocolate organogram and other stuff lovely hey, very that's nice. Really nice keep them coming uh 10 minutes michelle no problem i've just got a few more things uh, to go through really um it's just where do we go from here so we are in a situation we hope restrictions are going to ease um but there is no certainty so what do we do well we keep speaking to people we keep asking questions we keep finding out how people feel because that will change and becky i, I was just kind of reflecting on what you said at the start you sort of said I'm really excited, but I'm also nervous. And you've kind of got lots of mixed feelings. And, and I think a lot of people will have those feelings and they'll have them at different times. So it's really important we keep asking, how are you feeling? And, you know, your temperature gauge surveys, your manager's asking these questions. How are you feeling at the moment? What do you need from us? Because it will change. So keep asking, keep asking for feedback. Um, and then it's about shaping plans together. So... You can only shape so much. So shape what you you, you know. So it, it's, again, thinking about what can we do? So we know this is going to happen. So what can we do? So one of the things we might do is we're going to pull together a group of staff, um, all different levels to think. So we're going to go back soon. What kind of things do we want to do? One thing we can do is let's go back in when we're allowed and, and clear the desks, make it nice and clean for everybody to come back in. Um, another thing we're going to do is we're going to schedule out a block out the first morning just for no work. We're just going to kind of get connected to each other. So help to shape a plan, work together uh, to come up with plans. But these will be dynamic, but, you know, helping people to be part of that will allow them to own, you know, the return to the office. And then it comes back to welcoming people back. Um, so we looked at the kind of overall plan for the, the engagement and when we engage people. And, and actually, 
it's going to be a point in time. It's going to be a real significant touch point, that point when people come back to the office. So there's going to need to be kind of welcome activities around that. Um, welcome back cards, you know, a, a, a lunch for people, but also helping people to plan, giving them space as well to, um, to do the things they need to. So think really carefully about how are you going to welcome people back into your office so it's not um, it's, it's as easy as it can be. Because often we think about, I always used to think I had two and a half weeks off from work once and I went back and, oh my goodness, I was so nervous about going back after two and a half weeks and I've had a great holiday. It's a bit like that, you know, you return after maternity, you feel very nervous. So people will have very mixed feelings and to make sure it's as smooth as possible, think about the welcome plan that you're going to have to help people as they come back into the office. And of course, be mindful that this is going to be still tough for people and, and think about your well-being plan and what you can offer people and the support and give people space to feel whatever they're feeling, coming back to asking questions because for some people, it will be really exciting. It'd be great. I can't wait to see my friends to be, feel normal again, you know, to kind of sit at my desk. For other people, it'll be really overwhelming. For some people, they might find that their confidence has been totally knocked by a year out of being connected. So as well as thinking about your welcome plan and how you support people back in, think about the well-being offer and how you're going to support people as they come back in after a really, really difficult time, um, a very difficult year. And those are kind of my key points, really. Um, I guess if anybody's got any questions. We've answered all the ones that we've uh, had, I think. So very good timing. We've all, all learned the lesson of you don't take the Zoom to the end of the hour because everyone, <laughs> need, everyone needs to use facilities uh, before the next one that starts at three o'clock. Yes. <laughs> so hopefully if people are used to this now and they've got a good balance and well-being, it's healthy not to do one Zoom after another. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all learned that through the last year. <laughs> Absolutely. But thank you, Michelle. I've really enjoyed that. And I hope it's just been a really good reminder. I think we always talk about engagement, but I think our engagement now is different. We're coming into a different time. And I think for here and now, for me, certainly it's given me some good ideas around how we come back and for me is that communication no no question is a silly question and it's always good to get that clarification so my my takeaway from all of this is just keep communicating communicating yeah definitely absolutely that's that's absolutely the heart of it you know and don't worry about over communicating and don't assume that people know because they probably don't and if they do know they're not going to be angry for you to tell them again and not um, make it too complicated either no absolutely plain english accessible you know think about your audience uh, and what they need to know and, and make it as kind of authentic as possible allow you, you can put yourself into it as well but no thank you um as i said we we'll always talk about engagement. It's just a really good opportunity to catch up and hopefully people have got lots of good ideas and tips. Um, if anybody wants to reach out and chat to Michelle um, directly, if you've got any questions, please feel free to get in touch with James and I and we can pass on uh, Michelle's details or um, she's available on LinkedIn. Um, don't forget as the, uh, oh, there you go. And there's all her contact details. Thank you. <laughs> <for now. laughs> Um, don't forget, everybody, as you uh, log off, you will get uh, feedback. Um, so any thoughts, ideas for future events would be fantastic. But also it will be about how you feel about coming back to face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Hopefully at some point this year, we can all be back together in person and enjoying the, the lovely facilities at Mills and Reeve. And what I always love is their bacon rolls at breakfast. <laughs> I'm glad missed, that's the, the main thing you take away from that. I bit. know. I miss the bacon rolls from our breakfast meetings. <laughs> um, but it might be moving forward, um, as with our working, maybe HR Energy, we do a mix of blended. It could be virtual and some days it could be in person. So any ideas you all have, we'd love to hear them. Um, our next event will be hopefully in June. Um, we're still looking for some ideas and speakers. So again, if there's any topics you'd love us to cover, please do let us know. Um, but as always, thank you to all of you for logging on, for always supporting HR Energy. James and I truly love what we do and we just can't wait to hopefully see you all in person really soon. Um, but uh, thank you, Sharon. Lovely to see you. Or, and Laura. Laura, thank you for your input as well. So great to see you all. Thank you for joining us and hope to all see you very, very soon.
Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Thanks. Michelle.